Hi folks and welcome back to Contract Law. This is video three in the video series on illegality and void contracts. And in the first video, we had a look at illegality via statute. In the second video, we had a look at illegality via common law and also the consequences that flow from illegality. In this video, we're going to have a look at void contracts and restraints of trade. So looking first at void contracts, now, much like our discussions in previous videos in this video series, contracts might be rendered void either by statute or at common law. And contracts that are rendered void at common law um, fall into one of three different categories. Firstly, contracts that purport to oust the jurisdiction of the court. Secondly, contracts that are prejudicial to marriage. And thirdly, restraints of trade, or what I lovingly call rot. Uh, those ones are really important, and you certainly need to do your readings on those. Firstly, looking at contracts that are void via statute. Um, not terribly hard and actually fairly obvious. If a statute says that contracts, arrangements, or understandings um, that do something or have the purpose or effect of something are void, they're going to be void. So uh, Section 64 of the ACL, the Australian Consumer Law, uh, says that a contract is void to the extent that it excludes, restricts or modifies the consumer guarantees. Good example there of a contract being void via statute. Another example, gaming contracts, they're going to be void and unenforceable, but they can be performed uh, if the parties wish to do so because they're not strictly illegal. In contrast, contracts might be void at common law because they offend public policy. And the first category here is contracts that purport to oust the jurisdiction of the court, that is, cut off one or both of the parties' access to the courts. Why do they offend public policy? Fairly obvious, isn't it, really? Uh, because everyone needs access to the courts. You can't just purport to... Uh, oust or exclude the jurisdiction of the courts. You can provide that the parties must try other avenues to resolve their disputes first before running off to court. For example, arbitration clauses are a fairly common instance here, especially in uh, commercial contracts, um, larger commercial contracts. Uh, but you still have to leave it open to the parties eventually to run off to court if they wish to do so where the arbitration fails. Uh, so that is the situation with arbitration clauses. Now, note the text does advise that the um, position here has been affected by various um, pieces of legislation in most states and territories, the Arbitration Acts. So have a look at that. But generally speaking, uh, if you do purport to just exclude court jurisdiction to prevent a party from going to court, that's going to be void at common law for uh, uh, being contrary to public policy. Generally, just the provision itself is going to be void rather than the whole contract. The rest will be enforceable. Uh, so that's ousting the court's jurisdiction. Another kind of contract that might be void at common law uh, is a contract that purports to interfere with, hamper or embarrass the institution of marriage um, of lesser importance nowadays. But in days of war, uh, this category of offensive contracts was more important. Uh, contracts imposing some kind of a restraint on marriage uh, or particularly contracts providing for future separation were all deemed to offend public policy. However, with Family Law Act changes, um, certainly contracts in relation to marriage and finances in particular, uh, prenups, prenuptial arrangements, are enforceable. Have a look at Raw 14.720 there. Uh, really just one for you to note more than anything else. The third and probably the largest category of contracts that might be void at common law for offending public policy are contracts in restraint of trade and they deserve their own little part of the prezi. So let's get down to it. A restraint of trade is a term that's designed to protect one party only. It stops the other party from engaging in trade in any old fashion they see fit.
uh, the right may apply during or after the main contract between the parties and it may be in the parties contract itself or it might be in a set of rules that uh, the covenant tort is subject to. We've got Buckley and Tutty there. The problem is that rots are against public policy because they infringe personal liberties and they deprive society of what would otherwise be available as skills, knowledge, uh, expertise that the worker possesses. And some common examples uh, you might have in a partnership deed, one of the partners agreeing that they won't practice within a five kilometer radius of the existing partnership for three years. Uh, the vendor of the business might agree not to set up the same or similar business within a 10k radius of the location of the business sold. A garage proprietor might agree to take supplies of petroleum products exclusively from one supplier for a period of five years. Or an employee might agree to give services exclusively to an employer and not work for anybody else within a radius of five kilometres for a certain period, for example, one year after termination of the employment, all very, very common restraints of trade. Now, the natural starting place is to recognise, as we have, that if a term is considered to be a restraint of trade, it will necessarily restrict the freedom to carry on business and will be contrary to public policy. Therefore, all of these kinds of clauses are presumed void. Not illegal, but all restraints of trade are presumed void. That presumption can be rebutted if the party seeking to rely on the restraint of trade can show that it is reasonable in the interests of the parties and reasonable in the interests of the public. Um, if the party seeking to enforce the restraint cannot show that the restraint is reasonable as between the parties, they don't get to go forward to try and show that it's reasonable in the interests of the public, the restraint will just be considered void. However, if it is reasonable as between the parties, then they need to go on and show that the restraint is reasonable in the interests of the public. If the party seeking to enforce the restraint can do this, then the party seeking release has to show that uh, the restraint is nevertheless injurious to the public on the particular facts of the case. So let's unpack the process a little bit. The first hurdle is to prove that the restraint is either reasonable or unreasonable as between the parties involved. And the two big questions here are whether the covenantee has a legitimate interest and whether the restraint goes no further than protecting that legitimate interest. What exactly is a legitimate interest? The main form of legitimate interest will be protection of a proprietary interest or something similar or analogous to a proprietary interest. So, for example, uh, protecting goodwill. Um, this is common. This form of legitimate interest is common in sales of business. So the purchaser will buy the goodwill, which is going to be impaired or damaged if the vendor can then go ahead and set up business right across the road. Uh, in employment contracts, the employer wants to protect their goodwill by getting the employee to agree not to solicit clients after the employment finishes. So that's the, probably the main category of legitimate interest. Um, other types of legitimate interest are protecting confidential information and protecting trade secrets. As long as the restraint of trade is focused on protecting those legitimate interests and goes no further than that, then the restraint may be reasonable as between the parties. The courts are stricter on contracts of employment, obviously, because there is a greater danger uh, on sterilising or extinguishing the ability of a worker to go ahead and actually earn a living, earn their wages. Um, so the other thing that might occur is that these kinds of contracts might or restraints might arise because of the better bargaining position that the employer has over the employee. Um, courts don't really like that kind of thing, so hence courts being a little bit stricter on employment contracts. A good example is Buckley and Tuddy, and in that case, the plaintiff played for the Balmain Tigers. There was a restraint that was contained not within the player's contract, 
but within the rules that set up the New South Wales Rugby League. Uh, these rules contained this system called the Retention Transfer Clearance System, and effectively it meant that a player on a club transfer list could only play for a new club if the new club uh, paid a transfer fee. Otherwise, that player couldn't be released to transfer elsewhere. Um, the plaintiff was on the Tigers' retain list, but he wanted to seek more favourable terms elsewhere. And the question was, was this system set up in the New South Wales Rugby League rules an unreasonable restraint of trade? The defendant argued that the restraint was reasonable between the parties because it said that the New South Wales Rugby League had a legitimate interest in ensuring that teams were strong and well matched. So that whole process of transferring needed to be regulated. However, uh, the court took a hard look at it and said that the restraint went beyond what was necessary to protect that legitimate interest. Effectively, a player could be stuck on a retained list indefinitely after ceasing to play for a club and couldn't be released to play elsewhere. Um, or a club could deliberately fix a really super high transfer fee um, to stop the play player from going elsewhere. Courts are less strict uh, in terms of restraints of trade on sales of business because the legitimate interest is so strong here. Um, generally speaking, the court will err on the side of thinking, well, the purchaser really needs this restraint in order to give them what they've actually bargained for. It will stop a, a vendor, for example, like I said before, just um, selling off the business and then setting up shop directly across the street. So the pull of public policy here to avoid the contract is less strong. The Nordenfeld and Maxim Nordenfeld case is the classic example here. Uh, in 1894, uh, Nordenfeld sold his business to Maxim for $1 million, $1 million, massive sum for those days. Uh, the, there was a restraint of trade that stipulated that Nordenfeld couldn't be involved in the munitions industry or any other business that the company was involved in, uh, that is the purchaser company, for 25 years worldwide. Wow, that is a very, very broad uh, restraint of trade. This case got fought all the way up to the House of Lords and the House of Lords held that it was um, a sale of business and a certain degree of latitude was required. That is because the purchaser needs these kinds of restraints to get the, to get the whole of the consideration that it was purchasing, that is the business and the goodwill. Um, also, these restraints allow the seller to command a higher price. So, as you can see, in sales of business, the legitimate interest kind of cuts both ways. It's necessary for the purchaser who's trying to enforce it and um, because it gives them what they bargained for. It's also, however, good for the seller because they can get a higher price. If they say, look, I'll sell you my business, and I won't go ahead and set up shop across the street, uh, obviously the business is going to be more attractive and they'll be able to sell it for a higher price. Um, taking into account the worldwide nature of the business and the huge purchase price in the Maxim uh, Moonfelt case, the restraint was upheld. However, one part of it was not upheld and that was the any business part. So uh, the restraint that was upheld was uh, preventing Nordenfeld from being involved in the munitions industry for 25 years worldwide. So that's the issue of legitimate interest. Now, there are a number of things that go into the melting pot of a court's consideration as to whether or not the uh, party seeking to enforce the restraint has gone further then they really needed to do so to protect their legitimate interest. So in terms of the scope of the restraint of trade, uh, in terms of area, the wider the geographic area the restraint covers, one kilometre, two kilometres, five kilometres, the whole of the country, or the longer the duration of the restraint, the more likely that the restraint will not be enforceable.
in terms of activities, if the activities falling within the restraint are not related to the covenantee's legitimate protectable interest, the more likely the restraint will be unenforceable. So if you recall back to the Atwood and Lamont case that we discussed earlier, where uh, the restraint covered not just the issue of pr protecting against the employee going elsewhere and uh, performing duties as a tailor, but it also <laughs> purported to stop them from acting as a milliner, haberdasher, and uh, even a child's outfitter. I mean, the court there saw very clearly that the uh, Covenant team was tr really trying to cast the net very broadly, trying it on and going further than protecting their legitimate interest. The restraint was unenforceable. The bargaining power, if the parties are bargaining on roughly equal footing, particularly in terms of sales of business, the courts will show greater latitude. If there's an imbalance then, like in employment contracts, courts will be stricter. The consideration paid, well, as we saw in the Maxim Nordenfeld case, that will certainly influence uh, a court's weighing up exercise here. Uh, the higher the consideration paid, the more likely the restraint will be enforceable. Uh, the context, if there is a serious context like a partnership agreement or where the parties have legal advice, then it's more likely that the restraint will be enforceable as between the parties. How have parties gotten around the issue of showing reasonableness between the parties and particularly showing that a restraint goes no further than protecting a legitimate interest? Well, the issue is more of a drafting issue than anything else. And what uh, tends to be used is the mechanism of a step or a ladder restraint. So you're putting cascading clauses uh, where the restraint is just repeated, uh, but in slowly smaller and more constrained increments. And the idea is that um, if any of those are considered to be going further than project protecting a, a party's legitimate interest, then the court can just simply strike out the ones that are offensive. Uh, so they'll say things like uh, the employee shall not um, work for an, a competitor within an area of 50 kilometres, within an area of 10 kilometres, within an area of 5 kilometres, or they'll say that the restraint applies for a period of five years, two years, one year, and then there'll be a separate clause uh, that addresses severability, saying that these, these variables are all to be considered separately and if any of them are invalid, uh, then they can be severed and it won't affect the uh, enforceability of the remaining variables as between the parties. That all sounds like a great idea. However, courts can tend to get a little bit ticked off with uh, these kinds of restraints uh, where there's too many variables. So if you've really gone for gold and you've gone 100 years, 99 years, 98 years, 97 years, and you said the court can just strike out whatever ones they think are, are offensive, uh, the court will just throw their hands up and say, sorry, too many variables there, and the whole, the whole uh, restraint is void for uncertainty. So it's a bit of a uh, winner-takes-all stakes game there. Um, but if you do it in a restrained fashion, not too many variables, you might find that it, ass it assists your client in enforcing their restraint. The next hurdle is whether the restraint is reasonable or unreasonable in terms of the public interest. And as I said before, if the party seeking to enforce the restraint can't get over the first hurdle and show that it's reasonable as between the parties, this question just won't even arise. However, if they can get over that first hurdle, then they'll need to show reasonableness within, uh, in terms of the interests of the public. Um, you're thinking to yourself, uh, how does this question even arise? What's a good example? The convenience stores in Wavell Plaza case is um, a decent enough example. So in that case, we had a covenant that prevented land being used as a petrol station. Uh, possibly reasonable as between the parties, but not reasonable in the public interest because as the party seeking release from the restraint showed, the public had an interest in encouraging competition in retail petrol sales and so therefore it was unreasonable in the interest of the public and uh, it was in fact void the presumption of 
the restraint being void was not rebutted. So that is the issue of restraints of trade. And that is our excursion into illegal or void contracts. As I always say, if you have any queries or questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, shoot me an email, catch up with me on Teams or Facebook or Moodle. Um, other than that, I look forward to chatting with you in a Zoom sometime soon. And until then, bye for now, guys.